Of course I can. I'm going to read from this book again because I like it. And today I want to talk about Queen Anne, who was 1702 to 1714. Queen Anne was the last and least regal of the Stuarts, and in some respects the most astute. She was the younger daughter of James II and of his first wife, Anne Hyde. This makes her one of our few monarchs to have had a commoner as a parent, a characteristic she shares with William the Conqueror. In November 1688, Anne deserted her father and joined the invasion led by William of Orange, who was married to her sister, Mary. For James, this was a shattering blow. Even my children have deserted me. But for Anne, it was the right decision. She was a Protestant, a loyal member of the Church of England, and Parliament was determined that the country should have a Protestant monarch who would uphold English liberties. William and Mary had no children. Anne, by contrast, had no difficulty getting pregnant. She married Prince George of Denmark, often dismissed as the dullest royal consort in history. Charles II said he had tried him drunk and tried him sober, and there was nothing in him. George was act actually an amiable man who wanted a quiet life and was happy for his wife to be queen without him demanding a dominant role as William had done. Anne and George were devoted to each other. Their irreparable sadness of their marriage was that although in 16 years she had 18 pregnancies, only five of their children were born alive, and four of those died in infancy. The longest lived was the Duke of Gloucester, who died in 1700 at the age of 11. This unhappy event impelled Parliament to pass the Act of Settlement, which excluded all Catholic claimants to the throne, including James II's son, James Edward, usually known as the Old Pretender. When Anne died, the throne would instead pass to the House of Hanover, which was Protestant and was descended in the female line from James I. Anne's reign was marked by continental triumphs of a magnitude not seen since Agincourt. John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough, broke the dominance of France. His first and most ast astonishing victory, Blenheim, was fought on the Danube rather than the Rhine, and confirmed him as the greatest general England had produced. It was followed by Ramillies, Odinardi, and Malplaquet. Historians often write of these victories as if they had nothing to do with the Queen, but that's unfair. Anne knew the Churchills exceptionally well. As a child of six, she became great friends with Sarah Jennings, who at the age of fifteen married John Churchill, whose sister Arabella we last heard of as one of James II's mistresses. William III mistrusted, mistrusted Churchill, who had deserted James II and had done so at the moment when it would cause the greatest damage. Anne, who had made the same desertion, was less mistrustful, and made Churchill the Captain General of her forces. This recruitment process was not in accordance with modern norms, and was abundantly justified by results. Anne and Sarah were for a long time so close that they called each other Mrs Freeman and Mrs Morley, nicknames which enabled them to converse on terms of equality. In the 1690s, when Anne was on bad terms with William, to whom she referred as Mr Caliban, Sarah was her prop to stay. Sarah wished to dominate Anne, and at length became insufferable. In 1708, she was replaced in the Queen's affections by Abigail Hill, whom Sarah had introduced into royal service. Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travels, observed that Anne had not a store of amity by her for more than one friend at a time. Sarah was so angry that she put it about that Anne and Abigail were lesbians. In January 1711, by which time the war with France was won, both the Churchills were dismissed. According to Walter Beichot, Queen Anne was one of the smallest people ever set in a great place, but the small person was in fact quite capable of standing up for herself. One of the enduring achievements of Anne's reign was the Act of Union with Scotland. This took place not because the Scots and the English loved each other, but because they were on such bad terms. Statesmen on both sides saw that unless the two kingdoms were united, there would be a recurrent war. Anne promoted the joining in 1707 of her two kingdoms into Great Britain, and was delighted when it happened. 
in 2014, the Scots voted in a referendum for the continuation of this union. For most of her life, Anne suffered from poor health. By 1702, she was already so lame that she had to be carried to her coronation in an open sedan chair. By 1714, she was grotesquely fat. She was known as Brandy Nan, in reference to her fondness for the drink. But she presided to the end at cabinet meetings, and managed the strife between Whigs and Tories with more adroitness than is usually realised. The Queen ensured that no powerful faction felt so permanently excluded from power that the Jacobites could take advantage of her death. In 1711, Anne founded Ascot Racecourse. The first race for Her Majesty's plate had seven runners. She was the last English monarch to touch for the King's evil, as Scrofula was known, a custom found as far back as Edward the Confessor, who reigned from 1042 to 1066. The belief that the monarch had the miraculous power to heal people by touching them was slowly dying out, and became unattainable once the Hanoverians took over in 1714. That's George I. One of the people Anne touched was the three-year-old Samuel Johnson. She had an ordinariness and a kindliness which made her a comforting figure. She was devoted to the Church of England and set up Queen Anne's Bounty, a fund to augment the incomes of poor members of the clergy. Clergy? Yeah. She was probably the first of our monarchs to taste ice cream, for soon after she died, her confectioner confectioner mrs mary eels published the first book in england to include a recipe for it there you go